Welcome to Plan Stronger TV. I'm your host, David Holland. On today's episode, I am joined by author Tom Corley to discuss the habits of rich people and how they create multiple income streams. Our panel of psychologists will discuss the challenges of money abstraction, and I will share three retirement mistakes you don't have to make. It's time to Plan Stronger. Plan Stronger TV is made possible in part by the following. Helping you create a better retirement through home equity. The Stephen J. Sless Group of PRMI, National Reverse Mortgage Leaders. Expect more with Sless. The Rice Law Firm is dedicated to providing prompt, high-quality, and fairly priced service in the areas of wills, trusts, probate, and estate planning. We also assist individuals with divorce, family law, and prenuptial agreements. The Rice Law Firm is the name you can trust. Using IRA, 401k, and other retirement accounts too early can be a big retirement mistake. Why? Well, you lose tax-deferred growth and you may incur penalties. I've got an example for you. Let's say a 50-year-old person takes $100,000 from their 401k. By doing that, they miss out on potential growth of their money. So in my hypothetical example, Let's say that the average return they missed was 7% a year on the 100000 they took out. And I'm assuming they didn't reinvest the money. So the 100000 that would have stayed in the 401k would have earned this 7% a year. And then at age 70, that $100,000 would be a total of 400000 because of the compound growth. So taking the 100 did didn't really cost them 100 It cost them... 400. Now, the reality check is this, and this is putting it a little differently. You can't get milk tomorrow from the cow you eat today. In other words, when we take money and we spend it or use it for something else, as opposed to helping to support our retirement goals and what we need to accumulate, then we really are taking that out of the equation. And it's not just that money that we're taking, but it's all the lost opportunity for growth and then the income you enjoy from that money down the road. So what's your takeaway? Well, <laughs> predictably, you won't be surprised, don't take the money. And what I encourage people to do is to think about what they're doing and are there other alternatives? You know, it's easy to look at our 401ks and these, these balances as a way to get cash pretty easily and address a problem. But there can be penalties, there certainly can be taxes, and there can also be this big missed opportunity. So if you can, do your best to delay withdrawals from 401ks and IRAs and other similar types of accounts, 457s, 403bs, all these types of retirement accounts until you get to 59 and a half, which is when the penalties go away, but you still have the tax and you still have the lost opportunity. So consider being careful with those funds. And if you do that, you'll plan stronger. It's time to talk about the psychology of money. Money has moved from coins to paper to plastic and now to digital forms. In the process, it has become more abstract. The big question is how does the change affect how we view money? And does its more abstract nature affect our decisions? Is this a good thing or bad? Joining me for a panel discussion on this topic are Dr. Art Markman, professor of psychology at the University of Texas at Austin and the executive director of IC Squared Institute, Dr. Christy Archuleta, 
Associate Professor at the University of Georgia and the Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Financial Therapy, and Dr. Brad Klontz, a Certified Financial Planner Practitioner in Boulder, Colorado, and a Professor of Financial Psychology at Creighton University. Welcome, everyone. Thank Hello. You. Abstract. You have some abstract thoughts for us, Art? Sure. <laughs> you know, money itself is an abstraction. We created currency in order to smooth transactions. You know, if we had to barter everything, I mean, how many goats do I give for a haircut? You know, it's hard to, <laughs> it's hard to combine those things. So we created money, which is already an abstraction. But initially, money was generally stuff. It was a precious metal and then it became paper, and then it became paper that didn't even represent the, 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 the precious metals. It was just a full faith and credit of the U.S. government. And then it became math. And if you think about it, you, ha you have to spend years of your life learning to do math. Numbers are not something that really come naturally to us, like, like understanding that there are goats in front of you. And so that actually makes it really hard to give real value to that money. And that has a profound influence on the way that we make choices. Hmm. What are we doing if not goats, Christy? Well, like you mentioned earlier, it's moved more towards digital transactions yeah. and therefore it makes it even more abstract than it has in the past and so people don't in general people don't really know what's happening in their financial situation they don't know how they're spending their money they don't know how they're saving their money they don't they don't know where their money is going or even really how much money they have coming in in terms of what is their net income coming in what right. is it that they have to spend and so the further we move away from actually handling our money, where, whether it's paper or by check, then we, we have less connection to it. And it makes it easier to do things that we might not have otherwise done if we were handling it in cash. How do we keep that connection, Brad? Yeah, that movement to, to more abstraction is so, so good for financial service companies in Las Vegas. Um, and, you know, if, if you've been to Las Vegas recently, things become much more abstract. It used to be actually coins in the machines, now it's credits. And you see, look at credits and it's really tough. You can't even tell how much money that is. It's just a number of credits and you have to do math. Um, and I'm not, I'm not saying there's nefarious psychologists putting that to action, but, it's, but it definitely leads to the tendency to want to overspend because you're just not emotionally attached to it. And this is happening with credit cards and, as you said, with digital currency. And so, you know, sort of the hack there is that the more tangible you can make your experience with money, the more conscious you're going to be of your spending, and it, which is probably going to be more in line with your financial health and your goals. And one of the things that you can do is to try to use some sort of schema, some sort of story that, that helps you to conceptualize what's going on. So for example, if you're trying to keep a budget, you can, you can get people to, to, to create a scale and say at the end of the month this is going to have to balance out or if anything we want it overweighted towards the side of the amount of money we brought in and so you can actually put a little scale up on your uh, on your refrigerator draw it on there and actually put the amount of money that you made in a in a particular month and then for every expenditure start moving that scale and make sure that it doesn't go beyond balancing out where you're taking this thing that's really a bunch of, of, of math you'd have to do and turning it into something visual that you can understand at a glance. Yeah, that's really great. Every semester I have my students track their expenses. They have, it's part of a bigger project that they have to do, but their reaction or the reflection upon the project is usually something like this. I can't believe how much money I spend on eating out mm -hmm. or going to, to do sort of entertainment. I had no idea that's where my money is going. And we see that in our clinic that we have at the University of Georgia as well. When clients come in and we're asking them to track their expenses based on whatever their issue is that they've come in for, they, they say the same thing. I didn't really realize this is where my money was going. So really making it concrete and giving them an activity to do so that they can actually see what's happening is mm. really key. Yeah, that abstraction leads to a lack of consciousness, which leads to your spending probably becoming out of line with your values and goals. Um, and so gr great idea, making it more conscious. And then if you do find a, a, an area in which you overspend, like eating out is a common one, um, sometimes you can use cash and just sort of set aside a budget of cash each month that you're going to use for eating out and then you would take that cash with you or perhaps it's gift buying. But if there is an area that you, you're constantly in trouble around, um, it, it's a great idea to make it more concrete. 
And I think it's also helpful to add a little bit of friction back into the system. So one of the things that this move to digital has done is, and the reason that we did it is because it reduces the transaction costs, the friction associated with, with, with transferring money from one place to another. But when it comes to your spending, you might actually want to add some of that friction back in, which means turning off the one-click buying. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, for a lot of students these days and, and younger folks who are playing video games that have in-app purchases, making it hard to do that so that in that moment, that magic wand that's going to cost you $80 in a virtual world may not be something that you want to be able to purchase mindlessly. Right. And, and actually, you can use that lack of friction to your own advantage, too, in terms of paying yourself. So, for example, you don't need to write a check every month you know, to a savings account or retirement account. You can automate that. So that, that's the way to use that lack of friction for your own advantage and, and start there. So frictionless savings, but high friction spending. That's right. And this is why I've heard people use the concept of the, uh, or the strategy of the, the envelope system, because mm -hmm. it's making mm -hmm. it where you're using dollars and, and their paper. Imagine that, you know, because everything flows into the bank account automatically, flows out for every, and, and all the companies, as you all know, they want everything to be um, auto deduct, right? Because they don't want to have to send you a bill, they don't have to wait for your check, and they don't want you just to not have to worry about it. It's a very different experience the next time you go to the store to start laying down $20 bills when you're doing the checkout. <laughs> It'll remind you. You'll be sitting there going, wow, I can't believe how much I'm spending. The swipe of the card, you know, to be honest, sometimes I don't even know what I spent. It's just like, shoop, you're out the door. But laying down cash, ooh, my, my hands are sweating. Well, thinking yeah, about just it. think about our kids. That I mean, I think my kids just think, oh, we're swiping the debit card or we're swipe, swiping the credit card. Where's that money magically coming from? Yep. So that okay. lack of connection and consciousness. Yeah. And, and, and turn it into effort, right? How many hours would you have to work in order to pay mm -hmm. for this thing so that it becomes not just concrete in terms of the money, but concrete in terms of the effort? Yeah, great insights. Art, Christy, Brad, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Ignoring the opportunity for an in-service distribution can be a big retirement mistake. What am I talking about and why is it a mistake? Okay, so with most 401k plans, you can do what's called an in-service distribution to allow you to reposition, move money out of a 401k while you're still working and move it into an IRA. This is a great thing because this allows you to prepare for your retirement in advance. All right, so why would you do this? Well, number one, you get more choices, okay? A lot of 401ks have good investment choices, but not all of them. And the choices tend to bunch up around stock funds, bond funds, maybe a stable value, kind of like a cash account with some interest. Uh, but there are a lot more choices out there in the investing universe. So you can take better control and establish what fits better for you. And to be fair, not all 401ks, even though they may have a variety of choices, not all of them have the best choices. I'll put it that way. Okay. So you, you want to have more flexibility. And by rolling the money into an IRA, you get more choices. And here's the key point. When you make the rollover from the 401k into the IRA, there's no penalty and there's no tax. And that's a big deal because when you take money out of a 401k and maybe make a withdrawal while you're still working for whatever reason, there could be a penalty and there could be taxes. So this is rolling it over to get it ready for retirement. Now, what else? Well, more flexibility, okay? You have a broader range of choices, but you also have an easier way of handling that money when the time comes. And my favorite reason for repositioning, moving that 401k into the IRA is what I call flip the switch income. You're getting that ready to give you income so you can use it right away when you retire. The takeaway is this, greater control of your finances with an in-service distribution. Consider it if you are past 59 and a half and approaching retirement, and you'll plan stronger. I'd like to welcome to the program Tom Corley. Tom is a CPA and a certified financial planner practitioner. He also heads a financial firm in New Jersey. Of special note, 
Tom performed a five-year study on the rich and poor and has identified over 300 daily habits that separate the haves from the have-nots. Tom is a best-selling author and his books include Rich Habits, Poor Habits. Welcome, Tom. Hey, David. Thanks for having me on. Oh, good to be with you. So you've got so much. I'm trying to get as much as I can out of you. <laughs> I want to dive right in. So the first thing I want to ask you about, which I know is a subject you've talked extensively about, you've written about it, multiple streams of income. Why is that so important? Well, it's, it's critical. And it's funny because I found in my research, I didn't know this when I started my research, but I found out that the self-made millionaires in my study, for some reason, had three or more streams of income. In fact, 65% had three streams, 45% had four streams, and 23% had five streams or more. Um, Richard Branson, Sir Richard Branson, uh, who I got to meet, uh, he has thousands of streams of income, right? Wow. And, and you notice how Facebook, when they started to get going, they had one stream of income, then they had two, then they had a 10, then they had 100. Google's the same thing. They always create, the millionaires always create multiple streams of income. Mm. And Everybody should be doing this. It's critical uh, because those multiple streams of income, David, they come to the rescue when you have some bad luck that occurs mm -hmm. in your life. They're your safety net. We you and I talk about safety nets a lot to our clients. Well, multiple streams of income can be a safety net. Okay. Everyone's sold <laughs> watching the program, Tom. How do they create it? Well, it's not, it's not uh, something you, ma you manifest overnight, right? Uh, it takes a little bit of time. So most people have a full-time job. Right. That's, the, you know, they got to butter their bread. There's no getting around that. I have a CPA firm when I started my Rich Habits uh, journey. I had to take care of, I had $40,000 a month of expenses I had to cover. So uh, I had to do it on the side. And this is where, this is the magic uh, of uh, creating multiple streams of income. It takes about five to seven years for each stream. But what's interesting hmm. is as you create one stream, it leads to another stream. Uh, so my writing books, which was uh, one stream, additional stream, that led to speaking engagements. Right. And then I wrote multiple books. And then I had China and Poland and, and Vietnam and India uh, publishers asking me to, if they could publish my books. Well, those were all different streams of income. When you add a stream, it doesn't mean it's one stream. It could branch out into three or four streams. So, you know, but you have to do it on the side. I did it in the morning. This is how a lot of the self-made millionaires in my study did it. They had full-time jobs, so they did it an hour, maybe an hour and a half a day in the morning. That was their power hour. Uh, that was when they were pursuing their dreams. Uh, and then they, you know, eventually that became a habit and they started pursuing other revenue streams. Hmm. That reminds me of the Marine slogan that they do more before six o'clock in the morning or something <laughs> yeah. like that, before what everybody else does all day long. So what you're speaking to, Tom, and this is really a key component of this is you're talking about self-made, you're talking about discipline, you're talking about patience. Those are some really um, essential pieces and is that a common trait? Is this something people can work on and develop yeah. as a skill? Yeah, here's the beauty of it. So when you pursue a dream, it doesn't matter if you're lazy, it doesn't matter if you are a poor reader, it doesn't matter if you quit on everything in your life. The interesting thing about pursuing something that really makes you passionate is all of a sudden, those traits manifest in you. I it's think. an amazing thing. It's like all of a sudden, I've become a hard worker. I've never worked hard in my life. Now I'm a workaholic. Oh, <laughs> guess what? I'm a relationship builder. I never did that before, but I need to do it because I want to, build, I want to meet this person. I want to meet that person. I've got to meet all these people to help open doors for me. You find yourself doing things manifesting success traits that you never, ever had before. That's why it's so important to pursue dreams and goals. So it really starts with it being a passion. Mm -hmm. So the first step in this process, I think I'm hearing you say, is that people need to really do a self-discovery and not necessarily look for something that's a get-rich-quick kind of, if you do this and you do this and there's this program and you're going to make all this money, and we're going to talk about that in a second, but really discover what you most care about, what you're interested in, what you are not going to consider work. That's right, and so what you're really talking about is finding some avenue in which you can experiment, right? Now, there's a lot of organizations out there, mentoring organizations, they allow you to uh, experiment with, uh, you know, how to build a fire, how to build a tent, how to hike, aer aer aerospace technology, lawyers, they, Boy, Scouts, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts do that, the, the uh, men's uh, 
mentoring clubs like the sure. men's, uh, men, or what is it called? I can't remember the name, but it's that kind of stuff where you're mentoring people, you're experimenting, and the experimentation process, it only requires about three months. Three months of experimenting with something. If you're not passionate about it, if you say every, You'll know. <laughs> every time I do it, I hate it. Yeah. Well, then move on to the next thing. Yeah. The whole purpose of experimentation is to uh, reveal an innate talent that you might have. Innate talents expose themselves in a couple of ways. One is that they're easy to do. They're easier for you to do than for me to do. Okay. Right? And you enjoy doing them. And that's why you've got to experiment and it leads to finding your path in life. Okay, so don't quit the day job and experiment on the side till you figure out what it is to create these additional streams. Yeah, and okay. you find something you, you love and you'll keep with it for the rest of your life and it'll lead to other things that you love. Like I said, it branches, branches out. All right, so when we start dabbling and looking at this, of course, one of the things we need to caution people about, Tom, is that's the, this whole thing about potential scams. You know, there's a lot of people mm. out there that know that everyone would like more income, that they would like something where they can work you know, 10 minutes a week and make, you know, another 100 grand a year, right. you know, in this get rich, get rich quick kind of schemes, what are some cautions in this area? Yeah, so the, 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 reason that, the reason that so many people fall for those things is because they don't want to do the work. Yeah. They want get rich quick kind of stuff. I have so many people who read my books, uh, about 21%. They write me the nastiest comments because <laughs> all my book tells, says to them is you got to work, you got to right. do this, you got to act. Uh, they don't like that. They want something that's quick, down and dirty, like you know, playing the lottery. Right. I want play, give me something where they I can play the lottery. They want a life hack. They want a uh, hack, right? So the thing is, the reason people fall for, for these, uh, you know, these scams, these pitches, is because of uh, you know they they're not doing their homework, educational risk calculated risk that's how you get rich that's how you should be taking risks you shouldn't be taking risks unless you really study whatever it is that you want to go into and here's the other thing find people that are doing it and then you know pick their brain sure so find out who's doing it and maybe spend a couple of years working with them and then you'll they become kind of mentors to sure. you and then you say oh so it's not anything that's going to happen overnight you've got to invest the time yeah, that's what it takes, time yeah. and energy. All right, Tom Corley, thanks for sharing with us. Appreciate it. Thanks, David. Appreciate it. I have a retirement mistake I want to share with you. Not understanding Social Security or not understanding it well enough. Why is it a mistake? Well, simply put, the wrong Social Security choices made at the wrong time can have significant long-term effects on your finances. Let me give you the reality check. Consider your longevity. How long do you think you're going to live? What has been your lifestyle? What is your family history? What does your doctor tell you about your health? I mean, we, most of us are pretty aware of our overall personal health and you know, know about our family. Um, consider how long you're gonna live and that'll be part of your social security decision. Be realistic about work. How long can you work? Um, do you like your work? That's, that's a big part of it, right? If you are miserable, well, you might need to retire and take your Social Security sooner rather than later uh, because stressful jobs can sometimes affect the first point, longevity. And also look at your other sources of income. Will you have other income that you can enjoy in retirement in addition to Social Security? Will you have a pension? Will you be able to draw on investments or other savings, retirement accounts, 401ks, IRAs, and have those accounts been properly structured to provide that income that you can rely on in addition to Social Security? And, I mean, there's a lot to this, and, 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 and is there um, income you're going to get later that maybe might cause you to want to take Social Security earlier knowing you're going to have additional income later? Or do you need to have the Social Security later because you can work a shorter period on the front end? So you've got to look at where you're going to get your income from and how reliable it will be. And you also have to have confidence in Social Security giving you income long term. If you're going to delay taking Social Security and then lie awake every night worried about whether it's going to be there, well, that may end up shortening your life. And when you do take Social Security, not be able to enjoy it that long. The takeaway is this, Social Security decisions are highly individualized. There's no one plan for everybody. 
consider your situation, plan it out, and if you do that, you'll plan stronger with your Social Security. We covered a lot on today's program. Thank you for watching. I hope you found the information and the guests informative, and I hope you plan stronger. If you would like more information about the topics and our guests featured in this series, please visit our website at planstrongertv.com. Also, if you have a question you would like David to answer, please send it to questions at planstrongertv.com. Plan Stronger TV is made possible in part by the following. Helping you create a better retirement through home equity. The Stephen J. Sless Group of PRMI, National Reverse Mortgage Leaders. Expect more with Sless. The Rice Law Firm is dedicated to providing prompt, high-quality, and fairly priced service in the areas of wills, trusts, probate, and estate planning. We also assist individuals with divorce, family law, and prenuptial agreements. The Rice Law Firm is the name you can trust. To order the free Plan Stronger newsletter and get the latest updates on the show, go to www.planstrongertv.com slash subscribe.